Okay, everyone, it's uh, Thursday afternoon, pillar forms. Anybody interested in a pillar form today? Uh, this Thursday, we did Fuhawk last week, and um, we ran through the sequence. So, you know, we can uh, actually go through a bit of the second half of Fuhawk for anyone that's following. Some of you are at work, but the thing is, opening with the salute, one, two, three, four. Five. One, two, three. Okay, you have the option of doing it like this. Push. Double tiger. Single tiger. Double tiger. S single tiger. What was that? One, two. Now you're going to turn. Double tiger. Single tiger, double tiger, stomp, double tiger, stomp, double tiger, one, two. Okay, so those are the ten tiger movements in the tiger crane form. And what it does is it maps out the flooring that goes into sort of the octagon. So that they call it the... Uh, the rice image, as a, as a, because the character rice is kind of in those four corners and, and so forth. So in the form, that's what we do. So the last tiger, we have the double step here and the double step here. And then we close off to here. Then we're going to step one, two, three, trap. Chun kill. Water punch. Punch, close, then we step again. One, two, three, four. One, two, okay, three, four. This is your crane movements. One, two, three, open, four. One, two, three, step. Kick, hook, step forward, right? poke, horse stance, phoenix eye, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Drunken fist. One, two, three, four. One, two, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, just like this, two. Three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. 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 One. Two, three, four. One, two, one, two, three. Okay, so that's the second half of the tiger crane form. Obviously, the tiger crane form is a signature form uh, to the Lamb family, uh, Hong Kun. It's 
Fuhawk is the signature home to us, but it's also um, a pillar form to anyone else that does uh, hunk, hunkun or hunga. So there's different lineages. You know, that's our version of the second half, and um, it has tiger movements and crane movements as the major part of it. Then you have, you know, because all hunga is five animals. You have the tiger, the crane, the leopard, the snake, and the dragon. So you know, that's representative of some of the movements. Uh, there's not a whole lot of snake movements in it. There's, but the thing is, the dragons, you know, some of the back fists and all those, they're, they represent uh, different type of strikes and so forth. The back fist actually represents um, elements rather than animals. So we use animals and elements as guidelines to some of the ideas in the movement. So we have water movements, that's the water element. We have um, metal, okay, and you also have sun punches, which is, is really representative of wood. Yeah. So really a lot of these movements, uh, this is a dragon movement where you double back fist, dragon flaps its tail, and the leopard movements are these. So you have using these as your leopards. But then obviously these are the crane. Anything that has wings on it is the crane. Anything that have claws like this um, could be tiger or dragon. So, so why use those? It's just for you know, poetic and um, names to de describe the movement. So what are names? Names are used to identify. You identify a person by their name. You identify a position or a technique by a name. So that's how, why there's names to those. Uh, some of those are not names to the positions are very elaborate. Um, we don't use the names like in Tai Chi as much because in Tai Chi we have 37 postures. In Kung Fu you got hundreds of postures. How are you going to remember all those different names? So you have the basic idea of what they are, the dragon, the leopard, and so forth. And then we don't get into um, too much of the description, although in the books they do have the name descriptions. Like in, um, this, the Sigong has actually a book, the Tiger Crane book, and he also has the Gungji Fuk Fu book, and he has the Iron Wire book. So in that book, he does have the name translations there. Um, some of his translations are actually a little bit shortened in some instances and slightly modified. Uh, mainland China has taken the Fu Hawk book and recreated the original one that Lum Sai Wing did, and they renamed some of the postures, and they rewrote the text for that book. So. Actually, that book is, um, if you go to uh, Fusan and go to the Wong Fei Hong Temple, they sell that book you know, in the little uh, gift shop that they have there. But it's the modern take of the old book. That's what that is. So anyways, um, Fu Hak has a lot of uh, you know, variant techniques. You notice a lot of movements are open hand, not as much as, like in Zhen Xiang, we have a lot of fists. You know, a lot of more punching in that. In the first form, we have a lot more punching. In, the, in some of the more uh, advanced forms, they have a little bit more uh, open hand or more open hand to be more sophisticated. You know, when it comes to uh, martial arts, you know, the, the sophisticated practitioners would say the open hand was more sophisticated. So, you know, the palm type things. And so Tai Chi if you notice, has very little fists and punch. It's a lot of open hand stuff. And that open hand is, um, in, in some sense, is much more sophisticated in the sense that when you move, it's much more graceful and there's much more of maybe uh, grasping and, and neutralizing forces. And then with the punching, it's much cruder. Like, you you know, when you're boxing, you use a lot of closed fists. It's all closed fists. You don't you can use your hands. In Kung Fu, we have both the hands and the fists, and that varying fists are used more for striking. It's a lot more crude. When you're doing this and you're grabbing or you're changing your hand, that's more um, intricate and much more controlling and much more targeting of maybe um, you know grasping and working with uh, ligaments and tendons or maybe hitting more um, nerve endings so that you know it's more penetrating and concentrated. Whereas if you're using, it's sort of like um, using a scalpel to kind of cut through where you want to go through like a surgeon, 
versus using a sledgehammer and trying to kind of battering someone in the head. So when you use your fist, it's more really, that's what I mean by crude. When we strike, 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 that's really more about what we're doing. So when you say, some people, person says, can you use the, these type of things? Well, what I just did was all fist movements, right? So when you're using all fist movements, you can see that there's, um, you know, a continuity of movement. So that's how you typically would, after you block and you strike, how do you hit someone over and over again as a continuity? So you have to be able to move and cycle through those movements. Not that, you know, that you should be doing this, you know, but it's a training. And you can have this targeting when you do your form, but at the same time, it's a response thing. You know, a lot of times, um, people that get into these brawls and so forth, they don't even know where they're hitting as long as they're hitting you. And that's really not a strategy that we try to do in Kung Fu. We want to hit targets. You don't want to, you know, if you're just crudely striking and hitting, hitting you don't know what you're hitting. So you ends up a lot of broken knuckles, hitting knees and elbows and hard parts of the body that it just becomes a conflict. But, you know, your goal is to hit targeting, which takes a lot more accuracy of movement, more penetrating, hitting soft areas with small objects. You know, that's really something that's a lot more tired. So your phoenix eye, when you strike, this is kind of a small object, a small um, area. So it's for hitting softer areas and more targeting. You know, I mean, if you hit your, someone's knee with this, you're probably going to hurt your, your knuckle. If you hit someone's eyeball with it, it's going to probably hurt the eyeball. So it depends on what you're striking. If you're hitting the temple or you're hitting or you're going toward the throat or the neck, it's going to be effective. Or you're like this or you're like this, you're going to be effective. But if you're back here and you think you're going to do a fingertip thri thrust while the guy's moving or kicking and you get your finger jammed, that's what ends up happening. And that's not because the technique isn't um, designed to, it's really the usefulness and, and, and using it correctly. So just as an example, if you block, you don't want to pull back like this and then go for the target. After you block, you're in the position, then it goes right from there. You know? For instance, if you grab someone's arm and you're in this position, right, and you want to hit the person under the arm, go into the armpit, then you would be able to do it while you're close. So sometimes your reference points are de designed and, and work with uh, contact. You know, when you hold someone's position and you're on the elbow, then you have control. But if you hold someone by the hand, then you don't have much control beyond here because there's folding, there's unfolding, there's t turning. So the closer you are to your opponent, actually the more control you have. So that's why when you use your bridges, that's what has to happen is you have to move in using your, your bridges. So in Hunga, we have a lot of different range motions. We have close range moves that are tight to the body, mid range, further out and further out and further out. They're all different ranges of motion to use in different instances, far away, close, counter, um, right up against the body, how do you work with that, how do you move, movements like this. When you go like this and you push out, it's when someone's in against your body and you expand your body and then that allows you to open up the space because then you can start to move and then you can move again. But once you're up against, you, there's no, you, can't, you can't do anything because you, you can't generate the power. So you learn to move. Even if you want to strike and you're up against your opponent, how do you, you have to withdraw and strike? There's, there's strategies of how to create um, the space to do the movement. So, you know, it happens all the time when you're close together. You, you can't throw a punch because this is a restricted. So how do you get that? You know, what is an elbow used for? What is an elbow used for? You know, what is a back fist used for, for wherever it is? So that's what you're learning. It's learning how to direct your movement in a direction efficiently, effectively, and as quickly as necessary. So that's really part of what we're doing with the forms. Okay, so we did Fu Hawk, and you can see this is a cutting hand. This is a leopard, and you're using the top of your knuckle, 
and it's used to strike. Uh, what would this be used for? The bridge of the nose, right above the lip, right in here, you know, areas like that, to the temple, you know, the eyes. Um, you know, for some reason back in the day, people always wanted to poke your eyes out, so they always had uh, striking like that. So because, you know, in the day when they had to survive like that, you know, it didn't matter if they really destroyed you. Today, you'd probably, you know, end up in, in jail or lawsuit or whatever. So, you know, it's not the best thing to do. So do you understand that that's what you're striving to do? Um, it's probably not the, um, uh, you know, legally the best thing to do. So, and then, you know, when the hands are moving like that, that's a middle block. And that's an exchange between the middle. And the other day I was talking about Sun style Tai Chi or Tai Chi and the Mudong or the, how the hands move. That in exchange is part of dragon. When you go like this and you go like this, is really similar to that kind of movement. It's an exchange between the two sides. Something like this is a punch over the head. You know this is pretty self-explanatory that that's a hook. Well, after you hook, you can back this, or you can palm, and then you can punch. So that's a, a cycle of movement that it becomes a, a combination. You know, how many um, you know, uh, fighting systems you have combinations of movement? That's a combination. What you're doing is, and what is a combination, is taking several strikes and adding them and putting them together. A couple, of, these are uppercuts. That's a fork. Punches. Cycling a punch like that. It's a sun punches working like that. So those are chill and chill, circular movement. Then you have this punch, then you have this punch, then you have this punch, this punch. That's what you're doing is learning how to cycle through it. So you're following someone, you punch, you punch, you punch, and you punch. You have your moving in and moving in, uh, getting closer and closer to hit your target. But here's what happens if you hit your target. The tendency is the target to move away. So then you have to follow it. You have to follow it, trying to catch up with the you know, the target that's moving. So hitting a moving target is a lot harder than hitting a stationary target. Then a moving target, if you don't catch up to it, even if you hit it, it's not going to be effective because the, the, the power that you're hitting is dissipated and it doesn't, you know, impact as well. You know, if you hit someone and does that, it's not going to be the same as when the person's like this and you hit so you have to set up those positions. Okay. Cover hand, that's exact. We talk about that a lot. Cover is this, and tigers work off of that. So cover is like a low block, a circular movement. It's a circular block. You know, versus some of the karate systems, they use a lot of fists. Here again, um, that would be not as sophisticated as uh, something that's open hand. But doesn't mean the effectiveness of the fist isn't effective. It is effective. So when you're doing techniques, you have to keep in mind um, what the application is and the body mechanics involved with movement. Now, between southern styles and northern styles, and northern styles appear to be a little bit more graceful because they're much longer. They're much so the application on the northern side styles is much different from the southern styles but they still have their basic punch <clears throat> and so forth and they have a lot more kicking techniques so you know northern styles of martial arts generally with the northern china that's why they call them the northern styles when you go to the southern styles it's usually you know the the hunga the choli foot you know uh, wing chun um, some of these, you know, maybe Wing Chun could be classified as in between, uh, but the thing is, uh, they, there's different styles of that even in Wing Chun, but um, they use more hands, so I would classify them more southern, more five, five ancestor system, southern mantis versus northern mantis. It's really regional and um, what they feel is more effective. So the southern styles generally have lower kicks and they have more hand movements. Um, you know, one of the ideas is that most of the southern styles were developed for people that were on boats. So when you are on boat, you want stability in your stance and so forth. Or if you're on a boat and you have to, you're going to be rocking around and so forth. So you want to be stable and strong. Uh, whereas, you know, with uh, some of the northern styles, more terrain, longer, 
more, you know, so, so it's a stylistic thing. In fact, uh, when you compare it to, say, well, Taekwondo, it's like a longer range type of a thing. Um, Shotokan or Gojiru, those are another southern styles, or they're more like the southern styles in, in, uh, in the punching and so forth. So, so you know, everything is some, somewhat stylistic. Uh, I think Gojiru has a little bit more close to the Honga style because I think the, um, the grand master of uh, Gojiru actually s studied uh, some of the Chinese styles. In fact, I think there's a, uh, a picture of uh, the grand master with Lam Zhou. Lam Zhou was actually, this is way back when, there was a picture of, I think it was uh, Grand Master Yamaguchi. He kind of studied, um, like they have this thing called a, um, I forgot what they called it, but it's like our butterfly palms. They're mashuki. It's like a butterfly palm. And that actually is very similar. So when the hands go like this, or they go like this, that's like a reversing the ball, but that's actually how we do our movements in the butterfly. So you can see the the commonality and the, the similarities to motions and styles. Okay. So when we do a lot of our positions, when we're in a horse stance, you know, we have our blocks. You know, what we're building is the geometry of our positions. Okay, all of these, they're all positions. What we're doing is learning how to maneuver into these positions, which I call a transition. And the transition is what varies among individuals. So the better your transmission, the more skillful you are. But if you don't understand structure, you don't understand transition, your, your transitions are going to be either OK, somewhat uh, like a beginner, intermediate, advanced. Those transitions are really what determines your skill level. And that, those transitions are really what determines your understanding of how the effectiveness of those techniques are. Because if you just do a low block, a middle block, a high block, it's very uh, clear as to what it's done, what you're doing. But when you have movements that are like this and they're like this, you know, those are a lot harder to interpret. How do you do this? How do you press? How do you press? How do you trap? And you turn to middle positions. How do you blend these movements? That becomes a skill that, um, you know, is really a function of time. The longer you practice, the more you practice, the better you get. That's as simple as it gets. But use the right guidelines and the principles that control those movements, like sink the elbow, relax the shoulder, is a very, very common principle in all styles, whether it's Tai Chi or Kung Fu. But sink the elbow and relax the shoulder is not so easy to understand because now um, you know, it comes into situational things and what happens you know, to set up the movement and the setup and the execution, they all kind of come together as a, a concept. And that's what has to be understood. So, you know, a water punch is really hitting with the back of the hand. And the form has a look. So what you have to do is look for that look. And if you, how do you get those looks? Well, some of the books that you see, you look at the old masters and see what the alignment of the position is. And you try to copy those images. So when I do a movement like this, I try to give you the best image that I can based on what I've learned. I go to a position like this and I come across. I find, have to find the best position and the best, best position and the best position. So when you go through your forms, that's what you're targeting. And if you can, um, if, you're, if you're able to simulate that and then create that image in transition action, consistently, then what you're going to do is uh, have a good presentation. So that's why a lot of my students in the past um, did very well in competition because they're able to capture a lot of those positions with power, strength, and timing. Right? Speed, power, and timing is, is critical. And then the imagery is what, you know, when they judge form, they go basically with those guidelines, right? Speed, power, focus. And obviously, um, uh, you have to go through it with a good execution. And then uh, if you're doing uh, hunga, it should look like that. If you're doing another style, you can't just grab a bunch of movements, throw it together, and create uh, something that has 
traditional values. Traditional values are very important because those are the theories and concepts passed down from generation to generation. So a lot of people that don't have the opportunity to learn from a traditional teacher won't get the traditional guidelines. So what ends up happening is you think everything is the same, but it's not. It's really not the same. There's a, there's a distinct stylistic difference. So, you know, the, the old masters would know right away um, whether it's what style you are, what this is, what, you know, the correct movement, the timing. They know just because of the experience. As they see, they just glance over. They can tell if you're good or not, and that's how it is. In, you know, sort of competition today, it's pretty mixed and it's pretty open with some, some of the styles. That's why they have a division called open division. And that's just a mix and smorgasbord of anything that someone can do. But that, and in, in fact, some of Wushu is like that because they have this open circuit and you can just put together whatever you feel like it. But then they have the, um, they tried to get back into a little bit of tradition where they have Nan Chuan and they have Chang Chuan, which is another category. But they're still either northern or southern. So you break it down to that. And then they have the characteristics of a wushu execution, but it still doesn't come down to what um, the traditional style, styles teach. So that's kind of important to understand, especially if you're teaching or you're competing. Uh, a lot of people in the foreign countries don't understand that that's what we use as guidelines. So um, it is interesting, but um, it's something I bring out because a lot of people don't really know that that kind of thing exists because all you see is a visual, and that looks pretty cool, that looks pretty nice. I'm gonna grab one of those movements and then insert it into my form. You know, in fact, you know, when I used to judge, we used to say, um, you know, if it's a trishurat, the flip-flop and the jump kick that's not in there should not be in there. You don't get any points for those. So, anyways, I think uh, I co covered a lot of territory with the a tiger crane form as far as uh, ideas and concepts, and then um, bringing you into what, what's, uh, pe what's people looking at and seeing today, um, you know, is really subject to interpretation and um, does it have the, the value that you want from that teaching. Uh, anyways, uh, continue to stream, share it, go to YouTube, give us a thumbs up, subscribe, um, hit the bell, whatever it takes, and you know, let other people know that we still have content going out. Uh, we're going to be opening up at the end of the month, and it'll probably be July 30, uh, June 30th, and then July 1st will be our new schedule for the month of July and August. September kicks in, and we, hopefully we can be uh, back in form, but I think it's going to be kind of slow here because I think there's still some apprehension about the social distancing and uh, you know, sort of the issues that are unclear, the uncertainty. Uh, but while that's happening, we open the doors. Obviously, our schedule will tighten. I'm going to have to teach more live classes. So we will continue to stream live, but not probably you know, within the, tame, uh, the same time slots because we have to see what our live class schedule will be. We, I, can't, I can't be at two places at one time. It would be nice if I could, so we'll see what happens. All right, on that note, have a good day.